The last area of Islamic law we're going to look at is Islamic legal procedure. Now, you should know that every law has two aspects. For every law, there is a right granted by the law, and there is a remedy in the event the law is broken, is not reached. So, in, if I engage in a contract with someone, if I enter into a contract, I have a right to expect the other party to comply with their obligations in the contract. However, if they fail to comply, then I should have a remedy available. So the remedy is a means of enforcing the law. The remedy gives the law meaning, meaning that simply because there's a law, that's not enough without a remedy applied to that law. So for every law, there are these two aspects, a right and a remedy. And we enforce the law, we uh, provide the remedies through a series of legal procedures. Legal procedure can in fact affect the substance of the law, meaning how we resolve a dispute can be just as important as how uh, the dispute arose, or who's in the right and who's in the wrong. And the law can, involve, can evolve in light of the procedure that is used to enforce the law. And in fact, it turns out that legal procedures can affect legal substance, meaning how we resolve the dispute can actually affect the substance of the law. And the law can evolve as a result of the procedure used to enforce the law. Now, legal procedure in Islamic countries differs from Western legal systems. Sharia courts traditionally do not rely on lawyers. Plaintiffs and defendants represent themselves. We don't need an intermediary. We don't need a third party to intercede between the judge and the parties themselves. And thus, trials are usually conducted by the judge. There's no jury system. Trials are conducted solely by the judge. There's also no pre-trial discovery process, which is a major um, problem in Western legal systems and certainly in common law Western legal systems. Furthermore, there's no permitted cross-examination of witnesses. And unlike common law, the judge's verdicts are not going to set binding precedents under this principle of stare decisis. These judges' verdicts are meant to apply solely to the dispute before the court. And every dispute is going to be individualistic. Every dispute is going to be different. And therefore, the judges' verdicts do not have the same power as the verdicts of, an, uh, of a court in Western legal systems. The Islamic tradition has limited appeal. The idea is the original decision should also be the final decision. So there is a right of appeal, but it is restricted. And we can see a milder version of the same principle in today's common law procedure, which permits appeals, but does not permit appeal of a fact that was decided at the trial stage. So in a common law appeal, we only can look at questions of law. What did the judge do or not do in terms of adjudicating the dispute? An appellate court in uh, the United States cannot go back and review the facts of the case. They cannot say, oh, this witness was lying or this witness was telling the truth. They cannot reach that. They can only address legal issues. And so even in our Western system, we have these limited rights of appeal. Now, one of the interesting aspects of Sharia is that there is a custom of prioritizing oral testimony, meaning the words of the parties themselves should be given the greatest weight. And rather than relying on written evidence, Oaths are given much greater weight. Now, we use oaths in Western systems as well. You've seen it on TV. I swear to tell, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? 
So help you, God, I do. Now, oaths are much more important in an Islamic system because everyone takes the position that when they are swearing an oath, they are literally addressing a matter between themselves and God. And so litigants will refuse to take an oath sometimes because they don't want to face God in the afterlife. In Sharia, you answer to God for everything that you did in life. And so oaths are given much greater weight in Sharia courts. And rather than being simply used to guarantee the truth of ensuing testimony, oaths themselves may be used as evidence, meaning if you take an oath and the other party refuses to take an oath, you can win the case regardless of uh, the underlying facts because you are willing to take an oath. Again, we have oaths as, a, as an aspect of the common law system for sure, but it does not have the same weight in large part because in the common law, people are, are not afraid of answering to God for the lies they may have told in court. Now, one of the troublesome aspects of Sharia law is that Sharia judges and scholars can only apply the law as it was set down by early writers. We said the Quran is the literal word of God, and that means that jurists cannot change or modify or extend the law. The law is what the law is, and the law cannot change simply to reflect changes in culture or society. So for instance, for 200 years, the law in the United States was uh, forbid same-sex marriage. This was the case up until 2015, at which point the Supreme Court looked at the issue and essentially said, the world has changed, therefore the law is going to change. And now same-sex marriage is legal. So you don't have that freedom in Islam because the law is the law. It's already been set down and it has not been changed since God spoke on the law. So oftentimes Sharia can be a legal system that's at odds with the modern world because it doesn't reflect the needs or desires or requirements of a modern society. There's a great case. Uh, again, I'm, I'm going to link to a description of the case. I'm not going to link to the actual case because it's very long. It involved a, a, a decision by the Pakistani Supreme Court. And in this case, what the Supreme Court of Pakistan was deciding is could an Islamic bank charge interest? Could they require interest to be paid on borrowed sums or interest to be paid on deposited sums? Because the Quran has a prohibition of what they call riba, when riba is interest. And they prohibit riba because in the Islamic legal system, Money should not make money. People make money. People earn money through their own efforts. And therefore, there is a prohibition against money making money on its own. And again, we sort of have a, a similar system in the United States. You can charge interest on a loan, but that interest cannot be too much. And too much is going to be decided by every uh, individual uh, state. This is, these are called laws against usury. And usury laws are simply saying there is a limit of how much interest you can charge. Well, the limit in Islamic law is zero. And so in this case, the, the Supreme Court of Pakistan had to examine this question of is the collection or payment of interest, is that legal? despite what the Quran said. And ultimately, after much analysis, they decided that no, it is not, um, it is not permissible. Reba is prohibited in the Quran, and therefore we cannot use it in our system. Now what they said is, there are alternatives. And what they specifically suggested here is that the 
parties could enter into an agreement, the financing party and the party seeking the financing. They could enter into a joint venture, a partnership, which is to say, I'm going to take the money, I'm going to use it for my business, and then I'm going to pay the money back. Well, you do that in the sense of a partnership. That means that the parties have a shared interest in the success of the business. In a Western legal system, once a bank loans the money, they want to get the money back, but they are going to get that money back either through your good efforts or through your bad efforts. So in this case, what the court said is enter into a joint venture agreement wherein both parties share the risks and share the rewards. So in conclusion, what do we learn today? Islamic law is the principal source of law in many predominantly Muslim countries. Sharia, Sharia law is derived from four sources. Make sure you know what those sources are. And then finally, Islamic legal procedure is unique. Know some of those key features of Islamic legal procedure. And that's all. Thanks a lot.